Okay, hands in the air. Now, think of every decision you make today and how many of them will be through the prism of your wallet or your purse. Economics determines the decisions we make every hour, every day. You may put them away. I'll be collecting them later. So, in the bags at the back. Thank you. Clearly, you've seen the video which simply encapsulates the importance of cancer control. And if the importance of cancer control is highlighted through this gathering, surely the importance of cancer prevention must be a prime consideration for this organisation and the work that we do. And if we take that principle to the next step and look at it through the prism not only of our wallets and purses, but the wallets and purses around the world, we must have a clear understanding of the impact that cancer pre prevention can have through the prism of economics. And that's what this morning is about. We have three outstanding speakers. I'm tempted to re read their entire CVs, but if I did, we'd be here for the entire hour. Rather, I'm just going to ask a few simple questions. Firstly, OK, no, I've gone backwards. OK, that's the one I want. Now, we've got three speakers. We've got three fabulous birds. Who's been to the bird park so far? If you haven't, you need to get down and see these birds. In Australia, we call this a galah. Some of us know they're not a popular or friendly bird. This one's a cocky, very friendly. A lot of people have them as pets and they're fabulous. Here's a macaw. Fabulous plumage, spectacular colours. Now, amongst our speakers, who will fit what bird profile? Will it be the, the milk stalk that delivers the baby that will grow into great and wonderful things? Or will it be a mere colourful plumage, Rachel? That's the challenge you have. When it comes to Frank, he'll be talking about taxation. Will we hear the, the wise owl of taxation or will he merely be a scarlet ibis digging around the bins around the world for what's left? And finally, we'll have Rob Moody. Some have suggested he's a peacock. In this circumstances, quite well camouflaged, I've occasionally heard him referred to as a goose. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what I'm going to do is invite you to contribute to the discussion. We will have time for, for doing so. But before we go, I'm going to make an advertisement. My friends in Western Australia have just left the Cancer Council of Western Australia. I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. There will be a two-day conference there in May of next year focusing on behaviour research and cancer control. Frank's one of the keynote speakers. For those who can get there, this is a, an international standard but intimate conference on cancer prevention, so I encourage you to give thought to it joining. Uh, my friends in Perth in May of next year. But before you think about that, I want you to think about our speakers and I want you to join me in welcoming Rachel. entirely unrehearsed, but I don't know how well you guys can see this, but I'm wearing <laughs> I think you got the plumage right. <laughs> that was really quite a surprise, folks. Um, thank you very much to Terry and to the organizers of this session. I'm delighted to be here. I'm actually always honored when medical and health uh, experts invite economists to come and speak with them. Uh, so thank you for welcoming, welcoming us into your midst. Um, I am an economist. I'm not a cancer specialist per se, but I think I will offer you some thoughts from how economists look at cancer and more broadly prevention. So some of the things that I will show you will not be only related to cancer, but really we're looking at a very broad range of risk factors and environments that affect cancer and affect non-communicable diseases. Um, so there is a lot to say about the economics of prevention, and the organizers offered me this nice three-hour time slot to be able to cover the waterfront. Thank you. But actually, I don't have to cover the whole waterfront. Frank is going to talk about taxes, and Rob will cover prevention in different settings, and I'll cover the rest. So we should get started here, um, but I have 20 minutes, so don't worry. Let's see if I can get... Oops. Figure out how to do 
do this in an easy way without messing things up. Okay. So as you know, we can look at prevention from a lot of different angles, and I think that that's exactly uh, what Terry's introduction suggests to us. Uh, and I'm gonna approach this by showing you how prevention fits into different investment cases, why, how economists look at it through um, the lens, and we've done a number of investment cases, and I'll give you some uh, results. But I first want to um, refer to someone whom I don't know, David Whiteman. Uh, I just learned about him in uh, The Lancet a few weeks ago, a noted cancer epidemiologist from Brisbane. He was quoted recently in The Lancet as saying, as my career has progressed, the more I can see the power of prevention. The ongoing challenge is in implementing what we know works. We can talk about prevention all day long, but how do we achieve it? So I even stole his picture from The Lancet. I don't know him, maybe he's in the audience. He looks like a very nice guy. Um, but what, what I wanna do is not talk about prevention all day long, but give you a few examples of how it can be achieved and how the evidence from economics can help make the case for prevention. So I have two main points to set up the whole plenary here. One is economics can be used for widely different purposes. And if used credibly, it can be very powerful. And Frank will give us a compelling example of that through taxes. Second point, just like medicine, <clears throat> context matters. So we have to set our economic analysis into a context and interpret, or in medical terminology, diagnose appropriately. And Rob will give us, I think, some very nice examples, uh, insights on how to set these uh, issues of prevention into context. So I will proceed with uh, the examples to demonstrate how economics can be used in the service of helping countries prioritize how it can uh, reveal inefficiencies in what's being done and how to change that, and how, how uh, countries can determine how best to reach their goals. That's what we do with these investment cases that I'll be showing you. Um, they, we use, <laughs> the economists are not especially creative, so we use the same basic toolbox for all of the different uh, questions that we face, and, and it takes us pretty far but not all the way. And again, that's one of my messages is, you know, what can we learn using the economic toolbox? What is outside of our purview that comes up time and again? So I'll, I'll show you some of those things. So to bring out these questions, I'm going to talk about three different examples. Uh, tobacco, where we really have very good evidence, and you'll hear more about that from Frank. NCDs more broadly, we're doing NCD investment cases, which requires us to look at a lot of different risks and a lot of different disease outcomes where the evidence is not as good. And then um, we've done an investment case on adolescent NCD risks uh, where the evidence is really fairly weak. And, and when I talk about the evidence, there's a lot of different inputs to these investment cases and I'll give you a flavor of that and then I'll wrap up with what we've learned. So I wanna put this in the context of SDGs. We're all familiar with the SDGs. Um, I wanna frame it in terms of the SDGs that are most relevant to NCDs, cancer as well as the other NCDs. And this, uh, this picture here draws from our Lancet Task Force on NCDs and Economics that was published this year in April. We identified nine SDGs uh, to which NCDs are centrally important, both uh, causally and, uh, and consequentially. So two-way two street. And I'm not gonna try to talk about them all. Um, our menu of investment cases doesn't even cover all of these different domains, if you will, of, of these SDGs. With more time, money, and creativity, we could do that. But I think the point here is that you know, prevention is, again, as I said already, a very broad-based picture. Economics is one of the tools that we can bring to that, and it can reveal a lot to us. But we have a long way to go uh, before we are able to discuss it in the context of the full range of SDGs and what countries are grappling with. So, okay, to get into the head of economists for a moment, uh, if you'll <clears throat> allow yourself, this diagram illustrates how we are moving from a disease approach, sort of a disease investment approach, how do we invest in eradicating or reducing one particular disease, to a health investment approach. Again, that's, that's really the spirit of the SDGs, is to understand those interlinkages, to recognize, as we all know very well as health professionals, that people don't suffer very often from one disease. They're often suffering from or at risk of multiple diseases, especially these chronic conditions that have a lot of common um, factors behind them. So we use the investment case and we, we're broadening it to this health investment approach, which is prevention-centered, 
a lot to be done at the population level, not to say that individual uh, services and treatment uh, don't matter, it matters tremendously, but a lot to be done at the population level, multiple sectors to be engaged, and we try to measure the economic gains both to the public and to the private sector. So that's kind of where we're coming from with these. Um, okay, this slide has most of the heavy economics, so if you can bear with me for this one, you've passed Econ 101, so hang in there. So in the investment cases, we measure how society produces value and how poor health diminishes value. That's sort of the main thing that we're doing, our little uh, economic magic. That can happen in the workplace, as you can see on the left here. And there's some terms we use, absenteeism, presenteeism, things that you don't talk about at a cocktail party, but you, know, you come to work, you might really not have a very good day because you're, you're feeling your hypertension is affecting you and you're kind of groggy and faint. That's presenteeism, or you may not come to work at all. Or in a very worst case scenario, of course, you die prematurely and you've lost those years of life and those years of productivity. So those are the things that we're measuring related to the workplace. In the middle there, the effects on individuals and households. They too have a great loss from from disease and from health problems. Of course, the early loss of life, lost income, having to pay for medical expenses when they're sick, caretaking, et cetera. Those things, I think, are very familiar to us as people, members of families, um, friends and neighbors. But we have to figure out, as economists, how to quantify, how to measure them, how to put them into a model. That's, that's what we try to do. And then finally, to society and to government, there are those costs that are mentioned here. So what we're trying to do is kind of capture all of that and say, all right, um, that's what we want to reduce. We want to reduce those costs in an equitable way, in an efficient way, through the use of the public sector and the, the things that the private sector can bring to us, and to do it in a way that is sustainable, affordable, et cetera. So I'm going to give you um, a little bit of uh, a tour through some of the evidence that we use in these investment cases that I mentioned and a few different results. I'm, don't worry, I'm not gonna give you the, the, the whole thing, not too many numbers, just, just a few. Um, I'm gonna start with tobacco. So as we know, tobacco is a risk factor for many NCDs. When we do our tobacco investment cases, and we're doing them with the FCTC Secretariat, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control Secretariat, I think we are measuring the health impacts on roughly 37 or 38 different disease outcomes. So there's, there's a lot uh, there to look at that tobacco um, is, is culpable for. Um, and it's highly preventable, as you know as well. So we have really, as I said, quite good evidence on tobacco relative to many of these other areas that we're looking at. Here's a very nice summary of the policies, sort of the, the list of favorite um, policies, the proven cost-effective policies, uh, for the most part, that are recommended for tobacco control, and a list of how implementing those policies affects prevalence of tobacco use. This is, this is like our nirvana. This is what we dream about, having a list like that related to all of the interventions and, and policies and services that we would like to measure as economists. And for tobacco, I'm not really here to, I'm not dwelling on these numbers, I'm not here to talk about those numbers, is the prevalence gonna go down 4% or 5% or 12%. I'm, I'm showing you that for tobacco, there's a lot to work with here. Um, what we do with it, that's what I'm here to talk about. As economists, we look at those policies, uh, where countries are in implementing those policies, what do they want to do, where are they now, and where do they wanna go, and estimate the effect of implementing those policies, whatever menu they, they want to choose from, uh, what effect that would have over a period of time, and what are the consequent health and economic outcomes. That's what we do. Then we can say X percent of GDP is lost from tobacco use, and here's what you can gain if you implement these policies. That's a pretty powerful message to policymakers. Um, this information, that th those steps here that are kind of described, get us about halfway towards the investment case. Deep breath. It's not really that simple, though, is it? Um, with tobacco, it's, it's all there, right? The evidence is there. People have been doing tobacco control and measuring the impacts for a long, long time. But we're doing it in countries. We're doing it where there are a lot of stakeholders. We're doing it where the situation 
varies dramatically from country to country. Jordan as an example. In Jordan, we're really struggling with, with shisha. Uh, that's huge. And it's not just huge as a matter of health. It's not just because people are consuming shisha and that has effects on their health and consequent economic effects. It is embedded in the way society behaves in Jordan. It is part of how people interact with each other in such a fundamental way that we're trying to capture you know, how, what would happen to, um, to the economy if they shut down shisha bars? That's something they're talking about doing. I think anybody in the room who's been to Jordan or countries in, in which uh, similar where shisha is important probably recognizes very well this is something much more than just a health, a health choice, a health policy. Um, secondhand smoke exposure in these shisha bars and in other um, businesses of hospitality. You know, it's, it's different from cigarettes. You know, how do we measure those differences? Moving on from Jordan, where we're, you know, we're struggling mightily with how to quantify these things and how to uh, project or predict, if you will, how um, society will respond to some policies that aren't yet very widely tested and proven. In Sri Lanka, the government wants to take a very hard stand on tobacco production. They want to shut down tobacco farming, and they intend to do that. But we have to then look at the farming sector and say, what are the benefits and costs to the farming sector and to the economic output of the farming sector from uh, eradicating tobacco cultivation? What might be the environmental impacts and, and we could go very, very broadly. You know, what are the, the requirements of the farmers to grow other crops as substitutes for tobacco? Again, uh, there are other products aside from cigarettes. There's uh, BDs and smokeless tobacco are very important in Sri Lanka. And there may be some people in the room who know this firsthand better than I do. So those are some of the considerations that we need to bring in. Some of the sort of the, the challenges to economics of simply doing a nice quantitative uh, analysis that shows, okay, X percent of GDP you can restore if you implement these policies. It's, it's not that simple. Um, let me move on to NCDs where it's a little bit more of a challenge. We again have some very good um, evidence. Um, we have the, the WHO Best Buys or otherwise known as Revised Appendix 3 where we have very, very mostly strong evidence. It's, some it's the evidence for the, the Best Buys are stronger than, than for others of them, but it's, it's, um, it's carefully, uh, carefully vetted, carefully reviewed, and um, affirmed by WHO that these are valuable and effective and cost-effective policies for the most part. And, and here for cancer, you can see uh, that there are a couple of preventive um, uh, interventions for cancer, not, not surprises, HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening that are recommended in the Best Buys. So um, what we do, I'll give you just a quick example from Jamaica where we've done an NCD investment case. Um, again, let's just focus on the numbers on the far right-hand column. I'm not going to go through the details, but this is sort of the end point of the investment case. We come up with the ROI or the return on investment from implementing different policies or different packages to address the different NCDs that uh, Jamaica wanted to address, both through treatment or management of disease as well as for prevention. And you can see again in the far right column that they're ranked there with tobacco being, tobacco control being the highest return on investment and then onward. It varies from country to country. It's not always the same for a lot of obvious reasons, but that's what we produce uh, in terms of the numbers. In terms of country context, and here's just a few examples. Um, the first example is actually from Tanzania, uh, where I was recently, and we were talking about um, medication for secondary prevention, um, as well as for diabetes. Here we're outside of a diabetes clinic, and they're really struggling with adherence. And so they say, okay, well, all we can really do is prevention, because we haven't figured out how to get patients who get diagnosed and get um, get medicines. We haven't figured out how to get them to adhere, uh, so we're not getting very far. So that is a big, the, the patient factor is a big one, or the, 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 the human factor. And here, some other quotes from these countries. Um, Men like fluffy women. I'm not going to even try to explain that one. <laughs> um, you could ask your Jamaican friends about that. Uh, that uh, foods, what are, what are sort of culturally dear and important foods uh, that people don't want to give up and that 
it's a challenge to, to think about changing those uh, eating behaviors and cooking behaviors. Or uh, the last one here comes from Mongolia, where Mongolia actually has the highest per capita number of alcohol um, uh, retail outlets in the whole world, uh, not surprisingly. And the Minister of Health herself said to us, people have to drink to stay warm in the winter. You know, what are we going to do? Uh, it's a really big problem there. So those are some of the country context issues that we deal with in the NCD investment cases. Let me sort of move on to the last example here where the evidence is even more of a challenge, and that's for adolescents. We wanted to look specifically at adolescents and how do you do prevention with adolescents knowing that these very, very serious risk factors um, not only are, have serious consequences in adolescents, but they have serious consequences throughout life because many people who take up these behaviors and habits in adolescence maintain them through life. So we looked at these three risk factors and we did a global investment case. This wasn't just in one country. Don't be scared by this. I'm only going to talk about a couple of the numbers. So in the lower table here at the bottom are three risk factors, tobacco, alcohol, obesity, we used the literature, the evidence we had available to choose two highly effective interventions for each of these risk factors. For each one of them, we, we chose taxation because it works and the numbers were good. And we also chose restrictions on advertising for tobacco and alcohol and then a school-based obesity program, uh, obesity prevention program. And on the far right at the bottom, you can see that we got uh, high benefit cost ratios. That means really good numbers, not so much for obesity, for alcohol and tobacco. For obesity, very difficult. The evidence is not strong and it's not very positive. So we found that millions of lives could be saved by intervening in adolescence, but we also feel like, you know what, we need a whole lot more country uh, examples. We need a whole lot more real examples of how to deal with adolescence. And, and as these quotes suggest, these are the kinds of issues that I think we, we need to work with, with the whole community. You know, behavior of adolescence, how do you change that? I've got two adolescents at home, I can tell you. It's not easy. And uh, so far, <laughs> I don't have the key to it. Um, what about evidence that is produced elsewhere? How much could we talk to a government about whether that's relevant for them? whether that's what we should be putting into an investment case for them, and Rob will talk more about that. And sort of maybe the biggest one for this discussion on prevention, you know, how much money should we put into prevention when the benefits are so far off in the future and people lack treatment right now? I don't have an answer for that. As an economist or as a human being, I don't have an answer for that. But it, it comes up again and again. So finally, to wrap up, what have we learned? Just a few high-level messages. First things first, population interventions work they have bigger impact and are more affordable than interventions at the individual level. That's not an either or, both are necessary, but if, if governments have not done those population level interventions, the ones that we have strong evidence for, then they have missed the boat and they need to go back and, and, and work on that. Context matters, I think I've given enough examples of that. Averages don't tell the story, even though often we're just working with averages from the data that we have. But once we start looking at adolescents or once we start looking at different subpopulations, we can find different results. And so that's important to be sure that we, we are looking at subpopulation level where it's important. And then finally, data gaps. I won't go into that. And every researcher has a nice long list of data gaps, and I could give you much more. But there are some very significant um, issues that we struggle with related to that. Let me um, go back to The Lancet and the article about uh, David Whiteman, which I found um, very, very interesting and compelling. And uh, your president had a nice quote in, in that uh, article about him that I think expresses e even you know, far more elegantly than I can all of the factors that come into play here in thinking about cancer prevention. And economics is but one little piece of that to understand what we can do to help make the case for cancer prevention and NCD prevention. Thank you very much. Now, the next speaker is so keen that he's going to beat me to the podium before I finish introducing him. Professor Frank Chalupka is a serious economist from Chicago. He's been working on this stuff for 30 years. He's a star in this field. Give him a round of applause, folks.
Thanks, Terry, and thanks to Rachel for setting me up. She already gave you the punchline that taxes work, and that's what I'm going to spend the next 20 or 25 minutes talking about as well. Um, so I'm going to cover where we are in terms of the evidence on tobacco and alcohol taxes and some of the emerging evidence around sugary beverage taxes, um, talk a little bit about why we haven't made the progress that I think we could have made with these taxes, and that's because of a lot of the myths that the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry, the beverage industry spread. Uh, when they misuse economic arguments. So I'll talk a little bit about those myths and some of the facts when it comes to those arguments. So whenever I start a talk like this, I like to give my all-time favorite quotes. Um, I don't know how many of you know who Adam Smith is. All right, a fair number. Um, Adam Smith is the founder of free market economics. Um, 240 plus years ago, wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, which is really what modern economic theory is based on. Um, and at that point, he included in there this quote, sugar, rum, and tobacco are commodities which are nowhere necessaries of life, which are become objects of almost universal consumption, and which are therefore extremely proper subjects of taxation. Um, so like Terry said, I've been working in this area for over 30 years at this point. Um, he pretty much defined what I've spent my life working on for the last 30 plus years. Um, started out working on tobacco and alcohol taxes, and over the last 15 years or so, have gotten into the, the area of sugar taxes um, and other food taxes. Um, it's fascinating to me to see how the, the discussion has changed over time. Uh, when I first started working on this, the perception was that things like tobacco tax increases would not have any impact. Uh, people were addicted. They weren't going to change their consumption in response to tax and price changes. And now we're talking about taxes as the most effective policy we have for reducing use. Um, when it comes to tobacco, we've got hundreds of studies from around the world that are very consistent, showing as tax and price go up, tobacco use goes down, and vice versa. Um, this is a picture from New Zealand showing as they've increased their taxes, overall consumption has gone down. And on average, what we see across high-income countries is that for every 10% increase in price, we get about a 4% reduction in overall consumption. And we see somewhat bigger effects in low and middle income countries. Um, there we see somewhere around a 5% um, reduction in consumption in response to that 10% increase in price on average, uh, but with a lot more variability, as Rachel talked about. The country context really matters in terms of how fast the country is developing, how um, the tax structures look, and things like that. About half the impact that we estimate is through reductions in prevalence, through reductions in the number of people who smoke. Um, so this is a picture from Brazil where they've used tax increases over the years as part of their comprehensive strategy and have been very effective in reducing the prevalence of smoking. And most of the changes we see in prevalence are because smokers are going to try to quit in response to those tax and price increases. Um, so these are some data from the U.S. looking at calls to um, cessation support quit lines. And what we see is that there's a big increase in interest in quitting when taxes go up. Um, the big spike at the right is around our last national tax increase. Um, and you can see even before the tax goes into effect, people are calling the quit lines, um, seeking advice on how to help um, quit smoking. And we know smoking is a very addictive behavior, so not everybody that tries to quit is going to succeed. Um, but again, about one in five smokers who tries to quit in response to a price increase um, ends up being successful in the long run. And that's um, illustrated by this picture also from the U.S., um, just looking at um, the, the picture across states. Um, so some states have very high taxes. The states that have high taxes have many more former smokers um, as a percentage of ever smokers. Uh, states with low taxes, um, many more current smokers, many fewer former smokers. And then going to one of the areas um, where I think we do have strong evidence when it comes to kids is on the effectiveness of tax and price as a way of keeping young people from taking up smoking. Uh, so a lot of the work that I've done is focused on, on looking at the impact on kids. We see that they're about two to three times more responsive to price and very effective in keeping them from making a transition from experimenting with tobacco into more regular tobacco use. And again, that's just illustrated by this picture from Chile where they've increased taxes. And again, very effective in helping drive down youth smoking rates there. And in the end, this all translates into real health benefits. Um, this is a picture from France. Uh, the French government in the 90s decided to take on tobacco. One of the first things they did was to raise taxes. Um, and on the blue line, you can see prices going up. And as soon as they do that, you start to see the reductions in consumption on the red line. And then within a few years, you start to see some of the health benefits showing up in terms of reductions in things like um, lung cancer death rates among young men. 
And then you can see at the end of the picture, um, not such an optimistic story, where the, they stopped raising taxes, stopped raising prices, consumption stopped going down, and you start to see a flattening of, of that um, health effect as well. Um, so all this led us in the monograph that um, we recently published with the National Cancer Institutes and the, the World Health Organization to conclude that significant increases in tobacco taxes are the single most effective way to reduce tobacco use. And at the same time as they reduce tobacco use, they're also a very effective source of revenue. So even though tobacco use is going down, um, these tax increases generate significant new revenues. Um, this is a picture from South Africa where they steadily increase their taxes year after year after year. And as taxes go up, the revenues that they generate go up. And then those revenues can be put back into a variety of efforts to help promote health in other ways. Um, and that's why tobacco taxes get specifically called out in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda um, as producing a revenue stream that could be used for, for meeting those sustainable development goals that Rachel talked about. All right, when it comes to the evidence on alcohol, I think we have pretty much the same sort of evidence, uh, mostly from high-income countries at this point, but more and more emerging from low- and middle-income countries. Again, consistently showing that higher taxes, higher prices are very effective in reducing drinking, uh, reducing the prevalence of drinking, the intensity of drinking, the frequency of drinking. Um, and what we see is somewhat bigger effects for um, alcohol than what we saw for tobacco. Um, and the evidence here is, is relatively sparse from low and middle income countries, but very consistent with what we see from high income countries. Um, and again, the same sort of effects that we see with tobacco um, and young people, same thing is true for alcohol. Higher taxes, higher prices have a bigger impact on young people's drinking. Uh, so this is a picture from Ukraine. For a while, the value of, of prices on distilled spirits was going down in Ukraine as they weren't increasing taxes. And as that was happening, consumption was going up. Um, and then a few years back, um, they started to raise taxes. And as they raised taxes, as prices went up, you can see the reductions in consumption that follow. Um, we see the same thing when it comes to things like um, binge drinking, um, harmful drinking. This is some work that we did in the US. Again, looking across states, um, states with very high taxes on alcohol, much less binge drinking. Um, states with low taxes, more binge drinking. And then you name it, economists have looked at pretty much every outcome that you could think of that might be associated with harmful drinking. Um, a lot of work on drinking and driving um, and see the same sort of thing. Reductions in the frequency of drinking and driving, reductions in traffic crashes and fatalities. Um, and you can see that from these pictures in the US. Uh, we don't increase our alcohol taxes very often in the US. Um, the last tax increase was back in 1991. Uh, it's the only time we've increased taxes since 1954. Um, but when taxes went up, we saw an acceleration in the decline um, in drinking and driving fatalities, about a 21% reduction among the overall population and about a 28% reduction among young people. Uh, we've also looked at a variety of other health outcomes, cancers attributable to alcohol, liver cirrhosis, death rates, alcohol poisoning, cardiovascular disease, a uh, variety of different violent um, outcomes attributable to alcohol, things like spousal abuse and child abuse and suicides and homicides, um, as well as things like workplace accidents and sexually transmitted disease rates. And again, the evidence is consistent. As tax and price go up, we see reductions in all these harmful consequences of drinking. And alcohol taxes are like tobacco taxes. When you raise them, you also raise revenues. Um, so again, in the U.S., we've had one tax increase, but the one time that we increased our taxes, um, you can see the increase in revenues that followed from that. All right, when it comes to um, obesity, we've started to think, given what we've learned from tobacco and alcohol, that this might be an area where taxes and prices could be an effective um, intervention to change behaviors, to change diets. Um, economists have done a lot of work looking at the demand for different types of foods and beverages. And again, not surprisingly, um, as prices change, people's consumption changes. Uh, we estimate, for example, a 10% increase in prices would reduce sugar-sweetened beverage consumption by about 12% um, and would reduce fruit and vegetable consumption by around 5% um, and similar effects for fast food consumption. And again, when you look at the evidence around the world, the same story applies. Um, this is just looking at some data at how prices for um, junk food, sweet and savory snacks um, were changing over time um, and what that's done um, to consumption in different countries. And what we see is that as prices are changing, generally falling in most countries, consumption is increasing and vice versa. 
Um, and very similar story when it comes to soft drink consumption. Um, prices have generally gotten more affordable, um, and as a result, consumption has been increasing. Um, so again, given the evidence on the impact of tax and price, um, I started looking at how taxes and prices could be used to influence obesity. Um, one of the first things I did was just to pull together some basic trend data from the U.S., looking at what was happening with obesity rates and how that matched up with changes in prices. And what we saw was that over time, as fresh fruit and vegetable prices went up, we saw increases in obesity. Um, as things like junk food prices, sweets prices, carbonated beverage prices were coming down, we saw increases in obesity. Um, so again, we've been doing some work trying to tease out the effects then of prices on um, weight outcomes. And this has been a lot more challenging. I think there's so many other things that go into um, um, prevalence of obesity and BMI um, that it's hard to tease out the effects of price. But I think where we're at currently with the evidence is that it's generally supportive of the idea that um, prices are going to matter when it comes to people's weight outcomes. Um, so higher prices for relatively unhealthy products, lower prices for relatively healthy products are going to lead to better weight outcomes. And again, consistent with what we've seen from other behaviors, um, bigger effects in low-income populations, bigger effects among young people, and bigger effects among populations at risk for obesity. Uh, at the same time, we've been looking at the idea of subsidizing healthier options. Um, it's clear that subsidies are going to be effective in increasing consumption of the subsidized product by lowering its price. Um, but what we see is, is that that creates what economists call an income effect. People have more money to spend on everything that they consume, and they end up spending more on some unhealthy products as well. Um, and what you end up seeing often is a net increase in caloric intake. Um, so subsidies may be appropriate in some circumstances, but as a general policy to try to improve diets and reduce obesity, probably not such a great idea. Um, the one area then that this has really started to take off is with regards to sugar-sweetened beverage taxes, and I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that the evidence is really strong, showing the link between um, SSB consumption and obesity and increases in weight, um, and in part because these are non-satiating products. The calories that people take in from SSBs aren't offset by reductions in calories from other sources. And then there are other health benefits that go along with it in addition to the impacts on weight. Um, again, if you just look around the world, you can see countries that consume a lot of SSBs, not surprisingly, have higher obesity rates. And the one thing as an economist that I focus on is prices. And what we've seen is that um, these products have been getting less and less um, expensive relative to people's incomes. They've become much more affordable over time in virtually every country in the world. Um, the one exception there is Japan, where incomes had gone down. Um, that contributed to the reductions in affordability. But everywhere else in the world, these products are getting cheaper. So the first country to really take this on with a, a fairly significant tax was Mexico. Uh, Mexico imposed a peso per liter tax a few years ago. Um, that led to an increase in prices of about 10%. Um, and there's been a lot of work going on evaluating what the impact of that has been um, in Mexico. Um, and I'll show you some of the results from that. Um, again, consistent with what we see from the other types of taxes, these are also very effective in generating revenues. Um, that peso per liter tax, about 16 billion pesos in revenues in the first year that it was implemented. Um, so again, we've seen some good evidence coming out of Mexico showing that the tax has had its intended effects in reducing the consumption of the tax products. Um, so we see consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages is significantly lower than what it would have been in the absence of the tax. And we've also seen people substitute to, to healthier options, to things like bottled water, um, which aren't being taxed, um, whose prices have fallen in relative terms. Um, we've seen bigger effects in the populations that are most at risk for obesity. Uh, so this is looking at differences by income groups. Um, we see the lowest income group is the one that's responded the most, cut their consumption the most. Um, and then we've seen the highest income group has also cut consumption by, by about half as much as that low income population did. And then I think the key thing here is that it's the, the population that's the heaviest consuming population that responds the most to the price change. Um, so this is something that's consistent with basic economics. If people spend more of their budget on something, they're going to, to respond more to changes in prices. And we've certainly seen that um, in Mexico where we've seen the biggest reductions in consumption among households that are the heaviest consumers, um, and not surprisingly relatively little impact among those that don't consume much. 
All right, so where are we? Uh, if we look around the world, we see that most countries are not taxing tobacco products at anywhere near the levels that the WHO calls for, that the World Bank calls for. Um, alcohol is even worse. We see very, very low taxes on alcohol in many countries, uh, very infrequent changes. Um, we are starting to see some progress on, on the SSB taxes, but in general, they've been pretty small. Um, and that's because the industries that produce these products are very effective in lobbying against these types of taxes. Um, and they do that by misusing a lot of economic arguments. And I'm just going to highlight three of those um, and talk mostly around the experiences with tobacco where we have the best evidence. Um, the first argument they make is that if you raise taxes, that's going to lead to a lot of illicit trade. It's going to lead to a lot of tax avoidance, tax evasion, and then you're not going to get the revenues, you're not going to get the public health impact that you're looking at. Um, so just a few points on this. Um, the one thing that we know is that even when there is illicit trade in these products, we still see significant reductions in tobacco use in response to tax and price increases. Um, so this is a picture from New York City. Um, New York has some of the highest taxes in the U.S. They've increased those taxes over time. And about half the cigarettes that are consumed in New York either avoid or evade taxes. But even as that's been happening, you still see real reductions in adult smoking and even bigger reductions in youth smoking in response to those tax increases. Um, same thing on the revenue side. It won't generate as much revenue when you have significant illicit trade, but you still generate revenues when these taxes go up. Um, so this is a picture from Cook County, Chicago, where I come from. We have the highest taxes in the U.S. at this point on cigarettes. And as taxes have gone up, local taxes have gone up, We've seen increases in revenues, even though, again, more than half the cigarettes consumed in Chicago are avoiding or evading um, taxes. Um, when you look around the world, you actually see the opposite of what you would expect if this argument was uh, credible. Uh, so what we're looking at here is, is the share of the markets um, that's accounted for by illicit cigarette consumption relative to the price of tobacco products, which largely reflects taxes. What we see is that it's the countries that have high taxes, high prices, that actually have low levels of illicit trade in tobacco, and vice versa, countries with, with lower taxes that have bigger problems. And it's really not because taxes are driving this, it's because um, the strength of governance is a much more important factor. Uh, so we look at the strength of tax administration, we look at how aggressively tax laws are enforced, um, the presence or absence of corruption, and what we see is that these are much more important drivers of illicit trade. Uh, so countries that have a lot of corruption, the ones that are farther to the left on the graph, are the ones that have bigger problems with illicit trade. Countries that have strong governance, little corruption, are the ones that are very effective in dealing with illicit trade. And then the last point is that if governments decide to do something about this, they can really be effective. Um, so this is a picture from the UK. If you go back to the early 2000s, about 25 to 28 percent of the cigarettes consumed in the UK uh, were illicit, were avoiding or evading taxes. Um, and what the UK government decided to do was to really make that a priority, to crack down on it, to strengthen their tax enforcement, to adopt some of the new technologies that were available. And at the same time as they started to do that, drive down the levels of illicit trade, they've been able to raise their tax rates, increase their tax revenues, and reduce the share of the illicit market to less than 10% currently. Um, so very effective when they take this sort of comprehensive approach and make it a priority. Um, and that's all been embedded. The experiences from the UK, the experiences from a number of other countries have been incorporated into the illicit trade protocol to the WHO's framework convention on tobacco control, which, will, which has finally entered into force. The first meeting of the parties is next week. Um, it really talks about the importance of strong tax administration, strong enforcement, um, strengthening penalties and the importance of intersectoral, multisectoral cooperation. All right, a second argument has to do with the impact on the poor. The idea here is that these are some of the few pleasures that poor consumers get, and that if you tax them, you're taking away those pleasures. Uh, talking about the regressivity of these taxes. And what we tend to see is that, yes, these types of taxes are going to be regressive. Um, any consumption tax is going to be a regressive tax. Um, but if we start to think about the, the health benefits that come from these taxes, those are going to be very progressive. Um, and that's going to be because low-income consumers are going to be the ones that respond the most to increases in taxes and prices. And some of the recent work coming out of the World Bank shows that when you start to factor in what the implications of that are, 
in terms of, of labor market outcomes, incomes, um, spending on health care. What you end up seeing is that these can be very progressive taxes, um, not just from a health perspective, but also from a financial perspective. Um, that's illustrated by this picture from Turkey. Turkey is a country where they've aggressively increased taxes over the years. Uh, we've seen much larger reductions in tobacco use among the lowest income populations, um, so big to the uh, point where tobacco um, taxes that are being paid would go down in response to a tax increase. Um, and again, the bigger health benefits then accrue to those big reductions in consumption. And then the second part of the story is, is really what happens with the revenues that are generated from the taxes. Uh, when those revenues get put back into programs that are targeting low-income populations, you can really deal with any of those financial concerns uh, about the impact on, on low-income households. And that's generally going to generate greater public support for these taxes. Um, and I think the best example in the world is the Philippines, where they've done this, where they've aggressively raised their tobacco taxes um, over the last several years and taken 85% of the new revenues that they got from the tax and put it into a universal health care system, including some funds that are specifically dedicated to low-income households. Um, so you can see that the, the Ministry of Health's budget has tripled as a result of the revenues that have come in from the taxes there, um, and, most of the, and a lot of the money has gone into this, this special pot for low-income families. All right, the last argument that they make is that somehow if you raise these taxes, that's going to hurt the economy. That's going to put all sorts of people out of work. And if they're not earning incomes, then they're not going to be buying other things. And that's going to lead to multiplier effects that ripple throughout the economy. Um, so the industry has put this story for a long time. They tell you half the story. They don't tell you the whole story. Um, the industry talks about what would happen if you reduce consumption of their products and what would happen to employment there. And then they multiply that. They, they talk about how this is going to lead then to changes in, in distribution jobs, how it's going to lead to changes in retail jobs. Um, but what they don't account for is what happens with the money that consumers used to spend on these products if they don't buy them anymore. Um, they don't account for what happens with the government tax revenues and how the government spends that. Um, and the reality is if people don't buy tobacco or alcohol or sugary drinks, they're going to spend that money on something else, and that's going to create jobs in other sectors. Um, the government's going to take those tax revenues. It's going to spend them on typically very labor-intensive activities. And what you're going to end up seeing is an increase in jobs rather than a reduction in jobs. So these taxes can be good for the economy. They're not going to harm the economy. Um, we've seen a lot of work in the tobacco area where we've, we've demonstrated this across a number of different countries. Um, High-income countries, low-income countries, countries that are very dependent on tobacco, others that are mostly importers of tobacco. And what we generally see is this positive effect on employment from reductions in tobacco use in response to tax increases or other tobacco control measures. Um, to the extent that governments are concerned about this, that they're concerned about the impact on farmers, for example, tobacco farmers, uh, we've seen governments that have taken some of those tax revenues and put them back into programs to help farmers make the transition from tobacco to other crops. Um, so Turkey and the Philippines, I think, are the best examples of that. And we've been trying to address these same arguments now when it comes to things like sugary beverage taxes. We've got some good evidence from Mexico that shows that employment hasn't changed as a result of the sugary beverage tax and the junk food tax there. Uh, we've done some work in the US showing the same thing would be true if states were to adopt these taxes and just published a study on, on the impact of um, alcohol taxes on employment in the U.S. Again, consistently showing, if anything, we're going to see small increases in jobs, increases in economic activity as a result. So again, to summarize all this, um, I think the evidence is clear when it comes to tobacco and alcohol. We're getting better and better evidence on sugary drink taxes, that these taxes are very effective in reducing consumption, and the reductions in consumption are going to lead to reductions in NCDs, improvements in health. And that when it comes to these economic arguments that the industry misuses, um, the evidence there shows that they're either completely false or greatly overstated. And I think, again, that goes back to why tobacco taxes, alcohol taxes are on the list of best buys and sugary drink taxes should have been. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Frank. I can see a day when there's going to be an entire troop of people who have business cards that says, cancer prevention economists saving lives millions at a time. And Frank's going to be at the front of that queue. Now, before we go to our next speaker, I need everybody to stand up. Stand up. Put your hands in the air. 
Now, put them out wide as you can tell it. You, you can make it. That's how much you love our next speaker. I give you Rob Moody. <laughs> Nice one, Terry. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, and um, uh, and great to follow uh, Frank and Rachel. Um, and I'm as uh, sort of a, an interested amateur in this business. Um, I'm going to look at the politics, or the political ec economics of prevention, uh, much more than the, the the economics of prevention. And I want to look at. I'm meant to be talking about the transferability of prevention strategies, but I actually wanted to look at the industrial vector marketing strategies and their transferability from high resource countries to low uh, low resource countries first before I actually do that. Now, the world's top 100 economies, only 31 are countries, 69 are corporations. That was three years ago, two years ago. Now, 71 are corporations. Just to give you some context about who actually makes decisions and where these decisions are held and found and who actually runs the globe. Um, and just for those who happen to be from Australia or, or, uh, or Netherlands or Spain, Walmart makes more money than we do. Walmart does. So uh, in terms of, of, as I say, where the power and influence lies, then we really do need to understand this political, uh, this context. Now, this was last week, um, the high-level high conference in, uh, uh, in the UN uh, making a, a declaration and uh, interesting thing to note, there's actually quite a lot of women there, which is good. Um, and uh, they think, yeah, they've made a great donation, they've made a great uh, declaration. The point is, who actually runs the show? These are the leaders in in the US uh, of these supranational corporations. These are no longer multinational corporations or even transnational corporations. They sit above the state. And they, the world is changing in a way of where, where, where power lies. Interestingly enough, um, not too many women there. Um, and these supranational corporations see themselves utterly as global firms. This is. Uh, uh, Anheuser Busch. We no longer are uh, neighbourhood beer. We are a corporation representing the world, and they're now combining. And we've recently had this huge conglomeration between AB and Bev and SAB Miller to be the biggest uh, beer firm in the world. Um, we've had this combination of British American tobacco acquiring Reynolds, and described by their CEO by combining these two companies, will be creating a stronger, truly global tobacco and next generation. Uh, which we're seeing now, next generation products. And now, the, if we ever thought that tobacco was going away, they now have this wonderful approach where if you get buy e-cigarettes, you get the new um, heat-treated cigarettes, and you get your standard tobacco, so heat-treated tobacco cigarettes, and then you the Juul or, or IQOS, and you now have and standard cigarettes. The fundamental thinking behind it is all we need to do is keep something in people's mouths, and we can make money. And they'll do that from the very young to the dead. And they've got absolutely control of this uh, mechanism and their marketing around this and their investment is quite, uh, quite extraordinary. And obviously they've been making a huge pitch for low and middle income countries. Uh, and this is uh, David Stuckler's work um, to look at in a sense what's happened only in 12 years uh, in terms of growth um, of consumption of, of packaged food, soft drinks, um, alcohol, tobacco, huge increases in low and middle income countries, much less so in high income countries. So where, where are their thinking, where is their work, where is their um, uh, advertising marketing actually going? This is where I've been doing a lot of work over the last few years in Malawi, um, <coughs> which grows an enormous amount of tobacco. BAT ad, your heart is contented. You just don't mention the heart disease you get with it, of course. Um, Frank um, and Rachel have meant the, uh, mentioned the notion of the best buyer. So obviously we're talking about transferability of, uh, of approaches from high income countries or high resource countries to low income countries. Then obviously we're thinking about the best buyers. Um, the point is, and Frank's pointed it out, what those ones are, tax increases, um, bans on tobacco advertising, for example, in, in tobacco, tax increases, restricted alcohol, uh, access to retailed alcohol, bans on alcohol advertising, uh, 
you know, reduction in salt intake in food. All of those fundamentally relate to dealing with the industrial vectors of these diseases. So there's going to be tremendous, and we're seeing this tremendous opposition um, uh, in what's going on. A recently published uh, terrific work by, by Patricia Juma and her group uh, out of Kenya, looking at five African countries, looking at their NCD policies, saying basically they haven't been adequately implemented due to inadequate political commitment, inadequate resources, technical capacity, lack of data, and of course, industry influence. And I just want to thank Brian Sinclair, who presented a, a, a version of this talking about SSB taxes yesterday. Uh, and I've um, sort of adapted it in terms of designing and implementing best buys in low resource settings. So be prepared with your evidence. Absolutely. The point is, whether it's health evidence or whether it's economic evidence, it's necessary, but it'll never be sufficient. Um, and if you can't get yours, then see whether you can get someone for, uh, evidence from, uh, uh, from other places. But building that now and building it into the future is obviously um, absolutely essential. Considering this notion of local context, it doesn't matter how sort of universal we think some of these best buys are, local context really counts. Whether it's about how you can develop political will, how you can develop resources, um, data, the technical capacity, and how you're going to manage um, industry presence. Be strategic, be incremental. As we say, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, this takes time. There's only three, three things about good public health. It's persistence and persistence and persistence. You've got to hang around for a long time and wait. Wait for a while, take a deep breath, take the opportunity when it comes, but it, uh, in many instances, it may take 10 or 20 or 30 years. Uh, recently, in, in the Northern Territory in Australia, uh, they've just introduced a minimum unit price for alcohol. That started in 1986. Uh, we introduced plain packaging in 2012. That had started 20 years before and failed. It just takes, uh, can take an enormous amount of time. Find friends and, uh, and develop a broad base of support locally and globally. And this is where the, the world is getting, in some ways, moneyed leadership, but we need a lot more, in a sense, moneyed leadership. And I take my hat off to the Blue Bloomberg Philanthropies for the work that they're doing uh, in terms of actually having uh, money. We, you know, the, the notion that somehow countries are going to start to, to put their own resources in uh, without having the technical capacity, without having global networks, regional networks to actually uh, utilise and learn from is, is, is fanciful. I mean, the reason we made effective progress in HIV was because uh, of considerable amounts, huge amounts of ODA, uh, building of networks, building of, co uh, of capacity in regional areas between countries, uh, between the global north and global south, uh, this is what is needed. So if you've got a friend working in, in any of those areas in ODA, then talk to them, uh, as I say, hug them, get them on side. Um, we've made very little progress in that instance. I still can't understand why, um, but um, uh, this will not happen uh, without collaboration and financial backing for that collaboration. Developing thorough understanding of the legislative changes, particularly with uh, taxation, is really a deep understanding, working with people that do understand tax um, and really understanding their view uh, and understanding how or, or any form of legislation um, and, um, and then obviously preparing for uh, and countering industry influence. And I love this. Uh, and I, uh, from Susie, Susie Mercado at, at Wipro, um, the process of policy making in tobacco industry interference, simply just, it's just wonderful. This is how it happens. Policy idea, draft legislation, public hearings, manipulating science that they'll try and do, deceiving the public, discrediting advocates, corporate social responsibility, image building, seek a seat, uh, pro-industry version, make friends, make friends, make friends, uh, delay and weaken, delay and weaken, front groups, delay and weaken, complain, front group, and finally, avoid economic regulation, subvert the law, and sue. Um, so that's a, sort of a quick tour through uh, uh, what happens and what, uh, in a sense, we need to be very, very uh, au fait with in terms of working whether it's with, with tobacco um, or other industries, then uh, this is uh, what's happening in your backyard, whether you like it or not. Um, what these uh, 
uh, supranational corporations are now doing in terms of new forms of media um, is pretty amazing. Uh, if you're not into advert games, then get into them and find out how they're getting to your kids. Obviously, social networking sites, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, and the next two or three major um, uh, uh, networking sites that are going to appear in the next five years. Uh, mobile marketing, they know where you live, uh, and uh, obviously location-based geo, uh, geo-targeting. Uh, I just love Facebook, that's why I've gone off it, because they collect 97 pieces of information when you sign on or you like, whether you like that or not, and the fact that they will then use your information and flog it to other people and make money, uh, so they can re-advertise to you. Um, if you like, if you're a male and uh, you like Mercedes Benz, and then you change your um, marital status from married to unmarried, you immediately get an offer of a drive, a red open-top Mercedes. <laughs> and they'll only advertise red top, open, uh, open-top uh, Mercedes on dry days, not on wet days. <laughs> they know where you live. Um, I've had a recent discussion with someone who's been working in this field for the last 10 or 15 years. Just to start to really understand how marketing is working. Um, and his view is it's fundamentally about two things. It's mental availability and physical avail- availability. It's getting the consumer to notice, recognise and think of your brand uh, in a buying situation and the ability of the consumer to access your brand in time and space. It's actually really quite simple. Um, and this is two, mental availability, build and refresh memory structures. If you haven't, you know, share a Coke with a friend, do you cook with Coke, uh, whatever, this constant reminder, I'm seeing this in Malawi um, all the time as they, uh, as they start to grab major market share and of course depth and uh, breadth of distribution. I like this bit on the right. My mum asked me to get a seven up. <laughs> so what do we need to do? Well, I think we need to further advance what I call the science of corporatology. Um, it's the notion of really getting to understand and monitor the drivers of harmful consumption, production levels, cost, availability, advertising, sponsorship, political donations, the funding of research and the legislative and regulatory environment relevant to these commodities. This has to be a science. It has to be more than an art. Um, And I actually think that at at the national level, we need to monitor the behaviour of these companies just as we monitor the mosquito. You know, if you're if you're into communicable diseases, if you're into, you know, and you're you're uh, you're interested in malaria control, well, you you actually watch what the, those vectors do. Well, these are the vectors of the 21st century epidemics. National national surveillance systems should be watching. They should be learning. Otherwise, they won't actually be able to. Uh, uh, to understand and do what they're dealing with. I do take my hat off to, to SIATCA, uh, the Southeast Asian Tobacco Control Alliance, the work that they're doing on the tobacco uh, industry interference index, uh, and they've shown in, in uh, uh, Indonesia where this is getting worse, um, and you can pretty much directly relate prevalence levels to the amount of industry interference. So again, learning about what's happening, uh, uh, so we don't know, you can't really uh, act uh, and deal with all this. What we need to do, I think, and I just want to finish with this, um, is please, 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 as you can see, I'm begging you, don't lump the private sector into one homogenous group. The private sector is enormously diverse, enormously diverse, yet we constantly talk about the public sector and the private sector. And if you're in the public sector, somehow you're against the private sector. Not at all. One of the best things you can do for, for anybody's health is actually give them a good job. But the point is, there's some very unhealthy parts of uh, and unhealthy businesses. They're the ones we need to really focus on. But we also need to really focus on those that actually want to have people living long, a long um, and healthy and happy life. And whether that's working about how life insurance industries or sustainable agriculture or investment banking or health insurance or telecommunications, active transport industries or activity industries, get to know them, work with them, work out how we can align um, with them. And then on the other hand, you disinvest uh, from those that don't want people to actually live long and healthy lives, like the work, the, the fabulous work by uh, Bronwyn King and the tobacco uh, free uh, portfolios. And lastly, start hugging, at least metaphorically. Get to know digital strategists and marketers. Get them across. 
talk to them, understand them, work out what they do because they've got incredible expertise uh, and we, in a sense, we need to put our products into uh, uh, and use their expertise to help us uh, counter market, if you like. Lobbyists who live in the work in the corridors of power. I mean, our, again, our funding uh, to do that is, is, is hugely uh, limited. On the other hand, uh, we've got to be work, uh, walking in the, in the corridors of power. Investigative researchers who revel in uncovering the shallow hypocrisy and constant deception of these supranational corporations, and these particular ones, um, advocates who enjoy the battle, hug a public health lawyer like the McCabe Centre, uh, don't worry, Jonathan, we won't do it, um, you, and you may even want to use international campaign groups um, who are now actually, uh, actually going to be able to, to uh, change some of the, the balance of power in terms of uh, um, what we are hearing um, and, and dealing with um, every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. I've got 50 ringgits for anybody who can get a photograph of Jonathan uh, Lieberman uh, cuddling Paul Grogan. <laughs> it's in my pocket right here. Um, okay, so we've got corporatologists, we've got cancer prevention economists, we're creating new worlds and new professions here. Now I want to invite you to bring a question to this panel. Turning the theory, what you've heard, into the reality, that's a challenge that we face. So if anybody wants to come forward with a question, yeah. <laughs> oh no, this is a really... <laughs> no, no, come to a microphone. I, I can't believe I'm saying to Paul Grogan, come to a microphone. <laughs> I was going to punch him out at dinner last night. Great, by the way. I got that on record. Great presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody. A question for Frank. Why is illicit tobacco trade so high in Chicago? Because all you have to do is drive a few miles to go to Indiana to avoid the tax. Um, so the tax in Chicago at this point is six sixteen a pack. The tax in Indiana is ninety nine and a half cents a pack. So you can save five dollars just by driving across the border. It's cross border. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, Danny. Um, Neil Johnson, Australia, and King's College London. Do we have a problem with the post hoc prop to hoc fallacy? In other words, association is not cause and effect. And most of the data we have seen has said, because the price goes up, the consumption goes down. That's an association, not a cause and effect relationship. So, okay, I'm prepared to believe you, I want to believe you, but are we attacked by people who say that's an illogical fallacy, you've not proven cause and effect? I've, I've shown you some simple pictures, but there are hundreds of studies that are much more sophisticated that, that back it up, that do show that this is a causal relationship, that show how things change over time. Um, one of the projects that I'm engaged with is the International Tobacco Control Policy Evaluation Study, the ITC project. And what we do is longitudinal surveys of smokers across a number of countries to look at how as policies change, they change their behavior in response to those policies and then have as a control group other smokers that are living in countries where the same policies aren't changing. So I presented some simple pictures mm. um, rather than the, yeah. the I, econometric I, evidence, but the evidence is, is clear. Yeah. And that's not a challenge that, uh, th that the critics bring forward. Oh, it's absolutely a challenge yeah. that the critics yeah. bring forward. Um, but yeah, we have good <laughs> economic evidence. We understand the concept of causality and make sure that we can sort out the effects of tax and price from all the other things that are going on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Todd. Um, thanks, Tony. I, I wanted to um, follow on from the discussion around taxes and, and best buyers. And one of the ways, of course, that we can amplify the benefits of those best buyers is to then use the proceeds of those taxes on best value expenditures, so best value investments in cancer prevention, uh, services, etc. Governments generally don't like those types of hypothecation arguments until it suits them. So I wanted to um, ask the panel to reflect on some of the political and economic arguments that we can be using to encourage that amplification of investment uh, from tobacco, alcohol, sugary beverage taxation into much needed uh, investments in prevention and other areas of cancer control. So I, I can start and then I'll turn it over to, to Rachel and Rob for um, further comments. Um, so we have good evidence from especially tobacco taxes where they've been earmarked for different types of, of health promotion, tobacco control programs um, that show that when you invest some of the revenues that you get from the tobacco tax increases, 
into something like a tobacco control program, that that leads to further reductions in tobacco use, that leads to additional reductions in spending on health care, um, improvements in productivity. Uh, so I think it's, you know, showing the evidence um, that the use of those revenues can magnify the effects of the tax increase in reducing tobacco use and its consequences um, is critical. Um, so we had a session yesterday that you chaired that I talked about some of that evidence around tobacco and alcohol taxes. Um, I think the other thing that we are starting to see is, is a little bit of movement with finance ministers. Finance ministers don't like anybody telling them how to spend their money. Um, but we have started to see um, the World Bank and IMF come around to the concept of earmarking, at least in a way that they call soft earmarking, um, which isn't completely inflexible. It basically ties funding for a program to something like an increase in tobacco taxes. Um, so even some of the groups that have historically opposed this are starting to come around to it. Um, and I think part of it's going to come back to the sort of investment cases that Rachel's doing that show what the value of those investments is, what the return on those investments is. Just to add a little bit, um, I think economists, as Frank suggested, have been uh, traditionally some of the biggest problem here on this issue uh, because of exactly what Frank said. Economists have these notions about what is an efficient way to raise taxes and an efficient way to, 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 to spend money in government budgets. And this whole discussion kind of opens that up for examination. And fortunately, after s uh, quite a few years, the folks at the IMF um, and at the bank are, are really kind of taking a, a different look at it. I wouldn't say they're all the way there, but I think partly because of the kind of work that Frank and his colleagues have done, partly because of the work um, that he told us about on, on equity issues related to improving health. You know, when we talk about raising taxes, of course, people do worry about the poor, but we've actually been able to demonstrate that you know the poor are not well served when programs don't exist and the tax levels don't create the right incentives for them. So I, I think we've really been able to get more sophisticated as economists about that. Um, I wanted to just briefly, if, if I could, sir, uh, respond to, to your question, um, which I've now forgotten. Um, oh, the causality question. Uh, and say, I, I disagree with, I, I agree with everything that Frank said. Where I think we really do have some trouble is in the area of, for instance, obesity and some of the um, areas of interventions that are much harder, and, and his data, uh, he already showed you this, much harder to identify the causal relationships. And I work a lot on, on food systems and nutrition-related NCDs, and I was going to show you an investment case on that, but I didn't have enough time, fortunately, for you. But it's very, very hard to pin down sort of what works upstream to impact health downstream. And that's why we're struggling, I think, to have stronger evidence in those areas. It's just, it's work in progress. And Todd, if I can just come back to your, your point of, of, I guess I'm fascinated not, not only by the sort of intellectual validity of the arguments that we might use either for taxation or for, or for investments in, in, in what form of, of prevention or, or care, but it's actually the nature of the relationships that underpin it. Um, and the fact that it, as you saw from that, that slide of Susie Mercado about what the, the tobacco companies are doing, make friends, make friends, make friends. So it's not only the argument that really counts, it's what are the relationships that we have with the people that actually count and how much better I think we need to, to get at that uh, in terms of if we're going to have evidence actually ever translated into policy. Um, and, you know, it's the nature of how power works. Uh, in local context, how do we get poll how do we actually get the numbers up um, and develop those relationships? I think we just need to understand and, and work on that um, a lot more. Thanks, Tom, for that great question. Next one. Hi, I'm Dr. Nikki McCaffrey. I'm a health economist with Cancer Council Victoria and Deakin University in Australia. Um, thank you very much for those informative and very different presentations. Um, and I'd just like to pick up on uh, a point that was made during a few of those presentations about the value of um, adapting and constructing information for specific jury jurisdictions. Um, so we had some examples, for example, at country levels, um, but I wondered if um, you could all elaborate a little bit more on the value of providing that information at a more local level. I'll just start again. It comes back to this, how do you 
provide information in a way that people can actually understand and how do you have the relationship so they can actually understand it as well. And I think the more tailored uh, and the better you know your audience and you know what's, what are the key things that's going to change their mind, uh, then the better that's done, the, the more likely it will succeed. No, I think exactly the same thing. I think one of the experiences we have is that, oh, yeah, you can tell me that works in the U.S. or it's going to work in Australia, but it's not going to work in my country because something's different about it. So we've been trying to develop a lot more local evidence, um, get good estimates of how price impacts consumption in the local context, um, what's happening around the supply side, what's happening with illicit trade, so that we can really show um, in an in individual country based on their own data what's going to happen if you raise tax. Just a, a quick addition, and I alluded to this in talking about adolescence, and, and this is one area that I think is, is fascinating. It's like what kind of information and what form of delivery is going to influence adolescence or is going to even reach adolescence, and it's not what we've traditionally done in public health, I think. I mean, I'm not a big fan of information education campaigns, but it seems like it's, it, it's often what we resort to, and... <laughs> And it doesn't have a big effect, and we over and over again have shown that. So we got to get more clever, uh, you know, whether it's adolescents or other groups about, just, you know, people these days are getting information in very different ways than um, than they have historically. So I think your question is spot on, and an area where research is needed. Thank you, sir. Dr. Keen, Mass Med Commission. Now, I one of the things you said uh, is that when you have these uh, tax uh, taxes in place. It provides money for ministries and uh, programs in the government. And there are some countries, I won't mention any names, where the number one killer disease is not communicable disease, is not non-communicable disease, is intractable corruption. Intractable corruption. So that when you get the taxes, you're actually making things worse for them and not better because you are providing fuel for what makes society not to work, which is money that government has that enters into the pockets of people who then use the money to go and contest election. You have a minister of health, immediately he leaves, he wants to be a governor, so he goes to contest election, then he wants to be the president. And what, why, ha, why have you provided the money? By doing all these tax campaigns. So in that context, how would you advise um, advocacy leaders to campaign for something which they know will actually make the society worse? Thank you. I, I can't provide an answer on how you solve corruption problems. I mean, I think, you know, it, it comes down to exposing it to, 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 to really holding people accountable for what they're supposed to do. Um, but I'm an academic. I can't, I can't help answer that question. I think Rob may have some answers. Yeah, yeah. you hypothecate it for um, anti-corruption campaigns. <laughs> I mean, the point is actually, you know, um, working out, uh, you know, how you can actually shelve some of that, how you can protect some of that in a, in a system is obviously uh, one start. And then start civil society groups who will actually want to invest in, and spend time in, in corruption. How can they be um, externally funded as well? Sir. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the three presentations. Uh, my name is Faisal. I'm from Public Health Malaysia. Uh, so my question is to Rob. Um, uh, I'm particularly fascinated with your in the surveillance of the industrial vector. Uh, I've never heard anybody talk about that before. So it's a question and secondly, it's an offer. Uh, so my first question is besides the example that you showed for this yeah. Yatka, has there been any efforts towards that? And my second um, offer is that um, if you're doing any work on it, I'll be interested to be part of it. Great. Great, uh, thank you. I mean, I think the point around, I mean, groups like Inform Us, uh, Nourishing, there are other groups that are looking more globally and, and the, the um, group work on alcohol looking at sort of um, industry and, and, and corporate um, approaches. But I don't think many people are doing it, well, no one's doing it at a national level, but I think we actually do need to develop some examples uh, of how you could institute this as part of standard public health surveillance. So, can we talk? Great, thanks. All right, there's some hugging already starting. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, one question, a uh, specific question to Frank, and that is last time we talked about this, I think it was 2015, has there yet been any country in the world, Frank, that you know of that's seen a downturn in the net revenues from tobacco as a result of an increase in the tax rate? 
No, we haven't gotten to that point anywhere in the world. I mean, so Australia has some of the highest taxes in the world. They keep raising them 10 or 12 and a half percent a year, still generate revenue. Um, same things happen in New Zealand, same things happen in the UK. So we, we haven't gotten to that point. We're probably getting close in a few places, but not yet. I mean, the other point there is also the tobacco companies are making more. I mean, they, they increase prices as well. So they're making, they're not losing money either. No, the tobacco companies overshift tax increases generally, so they raise price by more than the tax goes up, and they s maintain their revenues. And blame it on government. Profitability and blame it on the government. Yeah. My second question, Rob, is to you, and for the most part, the reason I was interested for you to be on the stage was your experience in both the developed world working in Australia and your work in Malawi. From the discussions you've been having around the halls, what are the things that you would be interested to take back to Malawi in terms of the kind of options that you can pursue and see put in place there? Help. I mean, seriously, I sat down with um, the person in Malawi working on tobacco control. The person, three weeks ago. He's by himself, his group's by himself. Nelson, he's a fantastic guy. He's working, he's funded by the Norwegians to do alcohol work, but he's got no funding for tobacco work whatsoever. So the best thing you can actually take is, as I said, money and leadership. Um, so if anybody's getting money, let me know because they need help. Um, and they need support, just as I was saying with HIV or with any other global um, uh, programs, it's about people-to-people -people connections, about people supporting each other, people going into workshops, people going into into networks, into finding out information from each other, supporting each other when they're fighting. I mean, if you're, he's been threatened, just like people in Nigeria who've been um, threatened their lives, just like people in Indonesia. So we need to support each other, and and uh, any anybody that wants to help, let me know. Well, I guess that summarises beautifully what UICC and what these conferences are about. So it's about creating the opportunity to help help each other from learn from each other's experiences. I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, firstly to stand, if you would. <laughs> now, I want you to cheer loudly if you think that Rachel was the stork who delivered. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> I want you to cheer loudly if you think that Frank was the wise owl bringing us the goods. Now, nobody should ever call Rob Moody a goose. Give him a round of applause, folks. <laughs> Again, the plug to my friends in Western Australia. Thank you very much for coming and enjoying your lunch and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.